ओम स्थापकाय च धर्म से सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठाय रामकृष्णाय ते नम ओ राम कृष्ण द एस्टैब्लिशर ऑफ द इटर्नल रिलीजन द एम्बॉडीमेंट ऑफ ऑल रिलीजन्स एंड द बेस्ट ऑफ ऑल इनकॉर्नेशंस वी सैल्यूट दी इन द लास्ट रीडिंग क्लास वी लेफ्ट एट पेज नंबर फाइव वन टू फाइव हंड्रेड ट्वेल्व ऑफ दिस राम कृष्ण द ग्रेट मास्टर पार्ट वन वी शेल कंटिन्यू टूडेज रीडिंग फ्रॉम दैट पॉइंट दैट इज पेज नंबर फाइव हंड्रेड ट्वेल्व पैरा थर्टी थ्री द मास्टर यूज टू डिस्क्राइब इन डिटेल द नेचर और द एक्सपीरियंसेस ही हैड वेन द कॉइल्ड पावर वेंट अप थ्रू द कैनॉल सेंट्रलिस दट इज सुषुम्ना ही वॉज डिस्क्राइबिंग इन द लास्ट क्लास अबाउट द डिफरेंट योगिक सेंटर्स एंड सुषुम्ना इज सिचुएटेड इन द सेंटर पार्ट ऑफ अवर बैकबोन सो ही इज कंटिन्यूइंग इज डिस्क्रिप्शन द मास्टर सेट Look here," said he. "The something that goes up to the head, producing a tingling sensation, does not always do it in the same manner. It has five kinds of motion, as described in the scriptures, the scriptures of yoga. Number one, the motion like that of ants, just as ants carrying food in their mouths creep along." a line there begins a creeping sensation at the feet it then goes slowly up till it reaches the head when there is samadhi so this is the first kind of the movement of this power called the kundalini kundalini power moves from the lower parts to the higher parts but usually it moves from the lower part of the backbone to the brain but it sri ramkrishna description is it start from the feet itself from feet it goes up to the head something very very special number 2 the motion that like like that of frogs just as frogs hop twice or thrice and then rest and again they do so twice or thrice and then rest and so on they proceed a similar sensation is felt to move from the feet in the direction of the head and as soon as it reaches the head there is samadhi this is number 2 number 3 the motion like that of snakes a snake lies motionless in coils or at full length and the moment it sees a prey or is frightened it wriggles zigzag to the prey or to its place of hiding a sensation like that is felt going upward direct to the head when it reaches there one goes into samadhi this is the third movement of the mul the power of kundalini the motion fourth one the motion like that of birds a bird at the time of perching comes flying sometimes a little high sometimes a little low stops nowhere and reaches its destination straight when it takes rest a sensation with similar movements is felt proceeding to the head which culminates in samadhi and the last one the fifth one and the motion like that of monkeys just as monkey when it goes from one, one tree to the other jump from branch to branch suddenly and reaches the destination in two or three jumps so a sensation is felt to reach the head in two or three jumps and samadhi follows about the visions in each center while the coiled power goes up now in the passage of the sushumna the master used to say the vedanta speaks of seven planes the experiences in these planes differ from one another the mind normally moves up 
and down in the three lowest planes. Its attention is fixed to the anus, the organ of generation, and the navel, to eating, drinking, coition, and the like. If however it happens to transcend these three plates and reaches the heart, one has the vision of light. But although the mind rises sometimes to the heart, it comes down to the three lower plates again. If anyone's mind goes up to the throat, he cannot speak on any mundane topics. He will speak only of God. In those days, I felt as if I was struck on the head with a stick when anyone spoke of worldly matters. I would fly to the Panchavati where I would not have to hear the talk on those worldly topics. I would feel frightened and would hide myself when I saw worldly people. Relatives appeared to me, enemies trying to push me down into deep pits and if I fell once, I might not get up again. I felt suffocated. It seemed it was at the point of death. I was at the point of death. I could have peace only when I fled from them. The mind might come down again to the anus, the generating organ and the navel, even though it had reached the throat one should even then be other top. If, however, anybody's mind reaches the spot between the eyebrows, he has no more fear of a fall. The sixth center between the eyebrows, Ajna Chakra, if one reaches there, then the author says, Sri Ramakrishna said, there is no chance of coming down. He then as the direct knowledge of the Supreme Self, God, and remains continually in Samadhi. There is only one screen, transparent like gloss, separating this center from the thousand petal lip lotus in the brain, the Sahasrara, the highest point. The Supreme Self is so near then that it seems as if one is merged in Him identified with him, but the identification is yet to be. If the mind comes down from here, it comes at the most down to the throat or the heart. It cannot come lower down. The Jiva Kotis, that means common souls, never come down from this plane of the Ajna Chakra, the center between the eyebrows. After the experience of continuous samadhi for 21 days, the screen is pierced and the oneness of the Self with the Supreme Self becomes complete. To be completely merged in the Supreme Self in the Sahasrara is what is called reaching the seventh plane or reaching the highest spiritual experience of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. The Master's Retentive Power Hearing the Master speaking of the Veda, the Vedanta and the science of Yoga, some of us, however, would sometimes ask him, Sir, although you never learnt even reading and writing, whence did you, whence did you know all these? That means the Vedas, Yogas, Vedanta and all. The wonderful Master was not annoyed, even at that strange question from his disciples. He would smile a little and say, Ah, it is true, I did not study myself, but I have heard much. I remember all that. I have heard the Vedas, the Vedanta, the Darshanas and the Puranas from good and reliable scholars. <coughs> After hearing them and knowing what they contained, I made a garland of them, that is, all the books, by means of a string, and put it round my neck. 
oft offer it at the lotus feet of the mother saying here are the scriptures puranas and the like please grant me pure devotion first he acquired all the knowledge by hearing and he is supposed to be eka santagrahi once he hears he retains the entire thing he will not miss even a comma or a full stop such was his tremendous power he is here heard all the vedanta and veda and the yoga scriptures from reliable scholars so he is himself a scholar he knows everything so it is all in his uh, memory so but what did he do he did not keep that memory with him and then so bandy it to others he went to the mother and said mother here is all the thing knowledge acquired by me i offer everything you at your feet you take it you give me only devotion and he never spoke about vedas and vedanta in the original text which he had heard from the scholars scholars could not have told him the knowledge of veda vedanta only the the text they would have told so he remember all the texts but he never repeated you read in his gospel of sri ram krishna there is no mentioning he doesn't say any shlokas directly from the vedas or the vedanta the meaning he gives he didn't want any bang, banding of his knowledge of words what have got word to do when you have got the meaning when you know the person what will you do with his name so that was the, the tremendous the earnestness of sri ram krishna of having real knowledge not only the words so he said he offered the whole knowledge of words he had gained from the scholars to mother and said mother you take all this words and give me pure devotion he would see of the non dual mood or the mood beyond all moods now do you know the dvaita mood that is the last word do you know how suppose there is an old servant his master is pleased with him on account of his good qualities has faith in his words and consults him on all, on, on all matters though he is a servant he has got experience so he consults the master consults with him one day he the master is very pleased with the servant catches hold of his hand and tries to make him sit on his own seat the emperor's servant quails she shivers still the master drags him makes him sit there and says do sit down you and i are one it is just like that the non dual state when you say i am brahman i am the supreme god so that happens one the supreme god drags you to him you see the servant becomes one equal to the master when the master drags him to his side and then says we are one come so everybody will wonder nobody will object because the master himself out of love for him has dragged him and made him one with him equal to him like that god also makes the jiva one with him so then only jiva can say i am brahman because he has, he has lost his eye of the individual he has merged himself in brahman so he, he, he may express it i am brahman but that eye is not concerned with his body or with this mind it is concerned with that infinite spirit that is behind this so that is the same god alone is there in every being god alone is as god also so god in his infinite power god is in his limited powers through all the souls the same god is there so when we remove this ego that separates us from god the remaining part that is the pure godliness in us is the same as the perfect in the infinite godliness of supreme god himself so the jiva becomes one with shiva jiva becomes one with brahman the brahman and the jivatma they are same one so that is what is meant by i am brahman am brahmasmi 
these experiences are to be understood like that. So the Sri Ramakrishna actually explains like that, that the master dragging the servant and making him equal to him. If servant himself goes and sits by his side, nobody will accept it. At last, with the master, he will become angry, he will throw the servant out. Even the little servant ship he had, he will lose. So similarly, when a jiva attains to the highest Brahman, through severe austerities, thus gaining the love of the Supreme Lord, the Lord allows him to become one with him. Then, you know, the jiva can say, I am Brahman, I am God. Like the children say, I am mother, I am father. He feels it. His love of mother and father is so much. He says, I am father, I am mother. So, Sri Ramakrishna expresses this high truth of Advaita in such simple terms. Then, a friend of ours paid much attention to the study of the Vedanta at one time. The master loved him on account of his continence from childhood, devotion, steadfastness and so on. As he applied himself to the study of the Vedanta, meditation, devotional exercises and the like, the friend did not or could not visit the master as usual for some time. This did not pass unnoticed by the master. One day the master saw a boy who used to visit him along with our friend come alone to Dakshineshwar and asked him, Well, how is that you come alone? Hasn't he? That means Swami Turiyananda, who was to come. Where is he? Has he hasn't he come? The boy said in reply, Sir, he has now applied his mind intensely to the study of the Vedanta. He spends night and day in study, discussion and argumentation. It is perhaps because he thinks that time will be wasted, he has not come. The master heard this and said nothing more. Vedanta is nothing but the conception that Brahman is real, the universe is unreal. The person we are speaking of, that is Swami Turiyananda, was called Hari Haripada. Hari. So this Hari came to the Kshimeshtar a few days later. As soon as he saw him, the master said, Well, I hear you are now given much to the discussion of Vedanta. That is very good. But does it not amount to this? Brahman is real and the world unreal. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. So is it or is it anything else? You have to add something more. All that you are discussing and reading, spending your time, is it not contains only this fact that Brahman alone is real? Everything else other than Brahman is not as real as Brahman. They are all ephemeral. Whereas Brahman, the eternal. Is there anything else more than that in what you study? See how Sri Ramakrishna just gives the, the pith of all the teaching that would be that is contained in the Vedas, Vedanta and the scriptures this young man is studying. He is lost in the words and argumentations. But the real thing he has to know is only this truth, that God alone is true. Everything else is untrue, not true, as God is. The friend, it is Swami Turiyananda, later on. Yes, sir, what else can it be? The friend says that the master who opened his eyes to the import of Vedanta in those few words. Sri Ramakrishna brought him to the central point for which he should become aware. Otherwise, he will lose himself in the maze of words. It is like a jungle. When you get in, you may not be able to come back at all. The jungle of words. Shabda jalam, maha jalam. 
It is a great net in which you are caught, you will not be able to come out. The words, 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 words. Most of the ideas are lost in words. Some people talk so much and if you find, try to know what is the idea they are driving at, there will be no idea at all. I have seen sometimes great people admonishing good speakers. What are you driving at? You are going and talking for half an hour. Then the speaker will know that he is going on talking lots of words to express some idea about which itself he is not uh, very clear. Without a clear idea, he is one going round and round with hundreds and hundreds of words. It happens like that. Get lost in the mile of words. So small Sri Ram, Sri Ram told him, all oh, that your words express is only this idea. Hold on to this. That is enough. Friend, yes sir, what else can it be? The friend says, Swam Turiyananda says later on that the master opened his eyes to the import of Vedanta in those few words. Hearing those words, he was surprised and thought, it is indeed true that everything of the Vedanta is understood when one is convinced in one's heart of hearts of the truth of these few words. To know this idea, to experience this one idea, is all that is there that is required to be done. Not the reading of all the hundreds and thousands of pages of scriptures. The idea from that has to be taken and that should be experienced by us. To experience that one, you have to take a different direction, not really, but sadhana, these spiritual practices. That's how Sri Ramakrishna would bring the young people to the right path. Instead of allowing them to go and get lost in this mire of words, the master, hearing, thinking and meditating. Shravana, manana, nididhyasana. First hearing, you at first hear that Brahman is real. The universe is unreal. Then thinking, by reason and discrimination, you get that idea deeply and correctly imprinted in your mind. And after that meditation, you apply your mind to Brahman, the real entity. By renouncing the universe, the unreal entity, that is all. That is to be done. Of what avail will it be if one hears and understands this, but does not try to give up what is unreal? Giving up the unreal and experience the real is the main thing. People hear and go on argumentating, that is thinking. So hearing and thinking will not give you the experience. You must meditate and assimilate those ideas. Then, you know, the experience comes of God. That is the real thing. But does not try to give up. For that one, you have to, you have to give up all the worldly desires. Giving up the world means our worldly desires must all be given up. That should be done. For doing that one, you have to develop a strong will. Strong will comes with uh, tremendous conviction. The words of the Master, the words of the Guru. My Guru is, knows, he has told me to do this, to realize God, I will follow this. The tremendous uh, holding on with conviction to the words of the Guru, that's called the Shraddha, faith. So one should develop faith, that is the path for realization. Not merely reading and reading, and argumentating. It is like it is like the knowledge of the worldly people. One cannot attain reality by means of that knowledge. Conviction is necessary, renunciation is imperative. It is then alone that one can succeed. First of all, conviction, then when once one is considered conv convinced that God alone is real and everything is not so real as God only ephemeral, then give up the ephemeral, hold on to the real. That is renunciation. First of all, conviction, then the renunciation. If these there come to you, one can get the experience of the reality, supreme reality. Otherwise, you may repeat, there is no thorn, 
there is no pricking but the moment you touch the thorn you feel the prick and cry out in pain you may all argue that is i am the soul me no thorn can prick no sword can cut but when the thorn actually sticks you shout oh a thorn is stuck please come please come then where is your soul ship where is your knowledge of that you are the soul you merely utter there is no universe it is unreal it is brahman alone that exists and so on but as soon as the object of the world the sights the taste etc come before you you take them to be real and you get entangled how true it is how many of us do not know that overeating is bad we hear it from our doctors hear it from our relatives hear it from our parents and our own mind also says now overeating is not good it only gives you fat increases your uh, fat and then you lose the general strength also because all your blood is wasted on that fat we know all that but how many of us are very judicious or very careful in eating only the quantity that we should eat not possible when one the things come before you your taste your desire to have more and more makes you a gregarious person who on eating then increase your fat in spite of knowing that increasing fat is not good so knowing intellectually is not achieving anything to know means to achieve to feel to become one with that idea leave that idea for that you have to do something else that is give up that which is opposite to it overeating is not good give up should not overeat if that will power is there if we can follow that one then we will be able to experience that what it is not to overeat how sparkling health will come how your energy is released for higher purposes he used to speak incessantly on the vedanta to the people then one day i heard that he had contracted an illicit connection with a woman he said there came a holy man to the panchoti sri ramkrishna is giving the example he used to speak incessantly on vedanta to people then one day i heard that he had contracted an illicit connection with a woman i went to that direction in order to ease myself when i saw him sitting there that yogi who was having a bad name he illicit connection i said to them to, to, to that man you talk so much about vedanta what is this people talk about you he replied what does it matter i can make it clear to you that there is no harm in that when it is a fact that the world is unreal in the past present and future will it will then will my action alone be real that is also unreal that with my illicit connection is also unreal so it you don't have to bother about it neither have i to bother about it i was annoyed when i heard this sri ram kristali and said fail your never knowledge of vedanta that is the kind of knowledge which the worldly people have of vedanta that knowledge is no knowledge at all because this knowledge of vedanta i must have got it from a person who had no knowledge of experience of vedanta so the experience of anybody has of vedanta that is experience the one soul soul and the supreme soul inside oneself they would not have spoken like that the world is unreal and the god alone is real has a different meaning world is not eternal god is always eternal that is the meaning world is not there means it is if it is not there how are you experiencing so something is there then only you can experience something that is not there how can you experience if mango is there you taste if some, there was no mango at all they thought there is a imaginary mango or a mango in a drawing in a painting can you experience the sweetness you can't we experience the world the world is there 
So if it is unreal means God is eternal. World is only of temporary nature. It is short lived. So this is how it should be interpreted. So this interpretation is given by really realized souls. If there is a pandit is there, he will give only the unreal means unreal is not existing. But the effect of it will be dangerous. People will do his sinful things and say, it is also unreal. It is not going to affect me. It is going to affect. It is going to bring you into the, the hell instead of heaven. And you have to undergo a lot of troubles because of that. So, he says, that knowledge is no knowledge at all. Sri Ramakrishna objected very strongly to that. There, the conversation ended. So, Sri Ramakrishna was very vehement in getting at the central point of all the scriptures, of all the teachings of great people, of all practices that people did for realizing God. Are they holding on to the idea correctly? Or they have, have got a, any, having a guru, a right guide, have the conviction in what he has said and are they following the instruction and practically doing what the guru has said. He was very particular about that. So if anybody did not follow that, simply went on studying, he said, it's not good, you are, you are going nowhere. Some people go in the opposite direction as, uh, itself as that yogi. He was going in the opposite direction, trying to justify his illegal, illicit action as right. Then also he would get, get he would get annoyed. So Sri Ram could never there to show the path. He very clearly, in a very simple way. So we see one after another incident, giving the extraordinary experiences of this incarnation of God, and how simple he could express the greatest ideas. That is the wonder of the incarnations of all incarnations, especially this incarnation of Sri Ramakrishna. His language with the simplest form of Bengali that you can conceive. Swami Vivekananda said, my ideal of language is my master's language. It was very simple, it was very straight, but most powerful. So that is the idea. Everything was simple and powerful with him. So we heard so many things today. The next reading class, we shall read some more about the experience of Bhagavan Sri Ramakrishna. Niranjanam nityam anantarupam Bhaktanukam padhrita vigraham vai Yishavataram parameshem idyam Tam Ramakrishnam chirasanamama O oh, Ramakrishna, the taintless one, the eternal one, the one with infinite forms, one who has assumed forms for the sake of the devotees, the incarnate of the Supreme Soul and the adorable Lord of all, we salute thee, bowing our heads before you.